our first speaker, Caroline Andrew. She is a professor emeritus, director of the Center on Governance, and former dean of faculty of social sciences at the University of Ottawa. She has chaired the steering committee for the Ottawa Local Immigration uh, Partnership. She serves as president of the Women in Cities International and is a member of the steering committee for Ottawa's City for All Women Initiative, among many other activities. Dr. Andrew was the recipient of the Governor General's Persons Award in 2012. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, and I would like to thank Elder Lillian Howard for her very moving words, and uh, I'm indeed honored to be on the lands of the Coast Salish. Delighted to be in Vancouver. I was actually brought up in Vancouver, so it's nice to come back after a very long time. And I will be talking about partnering to transform cities. And I've got three things I want to say this morning. Why partnerships, ideas for doing good partnerships, and three examples that I'm going to give at the end. And I will say that if anyone wants to get a copy of the PowerPoint, they can just give me a card today, and I'm happy to send it to you. It's not very long. So why partnerships? And uh, really, the basic reason is that when you're doing complex questions that need a lot of people acting together, partnerships are a good way to go. And Transforming cities for women and girls in all their diversity definitely fits into the category of complex. It doesn't really fit into complex because of the objective. We all know what the objective is, and we all can feel comfortable about the objective. But the reason it's complex is you need a huge number of people and of different people doing things in the same direction in order to achieve it. Because as we can see and as we get into it, if you think of recreation hours for adolescent girls. And you have to convince all kinds of people, as was said earlier on, you have to convince people, uh, the adolescent girls who want better hours of getting access to recreation to say they want them. You also need a whole bunch of people operating those recreation hours to think about it. You need uh, city council to maybe legislate on it. So you really need a whole bunch of people. So it's not that what we want to do is complex. It's that you need a whole bunch of different kinds of people doing it that makes it complex. And because those people bring different resources and different knowledges. We all know certain things and we all don't know other things. And we also all have different kinds of resources so that if you can get everybody sort of pooling their resources and pooling their knowledges, then you can, get, you can move to getting things done. So what I really want to talk about a bit longer today is what are some lessons, I think, for good partnerships. And as I've said at the bottom of the slide, it's borrowed from some work done by a British woman called Chris Huxham. But uh, it's also my experience at working in different kinds of partnerships. One is that there's been a sort of a myth about partnerships that you have to start with common aims. And I don't think that's true. I think you have to build towards common aims. You start by getting people who share an interest in the same area, but they don't necessarily have common aims. Uh, I've done some partnerships with the city of Ottawa, and it wasn't obvious right away, to say the least, that they were big on gender equity and that they immediately thought this was the common aim we should work towards. But they did. There were, really, there were things that we could build on because there were things that they wanted to get done that we wanted to get done. So I think it's really important to think that you don't start uh, with common aims. You start with a common ability to work on the same issue. But it's really important that you build the common aims. And if it's certainly one of the things you want to monitor, if in three years after the partnership, the aims aren't more common, then that's a problem. And if you continue on and the aims don't get more and more common, that is a problem of how you've been able to build the partnership. But I don't think, I think it's sometimes uh, a problem to think that you need those common aims right from the beginning, because that limits your ability 
to imagine who you might like in your partnership. And if you can imagine in a much broader way who might be working in this direction, you can get people involved in the partnership. And then over time, you begin to discover that you actually are coming to a much more common view of what are the, uh, what are the issues in the partnership and what are the co things you share. So the second point about good partnerships is the question of power. And that's always a problem because you're bringing in people who have very different uh, elements of power and often very unequal power relationships. It's again, when you're women transforming cities, you often want to work with people who have a lot more obvious power than you do. I think it's both always something that needs to be discussed in a partnership, but I think it's also a question that there is what I've called contextual power. Like sometimes, uh, people who don't ordinarily see themselves as having as much power. Maybe, for instance, uh, you may have somebody who's got six months where they've got lots of time and can write the proposal to get some money to advance the partnership. And therefore, if they're holding the pen on writing the proposal, they have a lot more sort of immediate power in what goes into the proposal. So they may not be in the group that has the most formal power in the partnership, but they may actually, in the context of writing a proposal and say you're lucky and you get the proposal and you get the money, they've actually done, they've actually been in a much more important role in actually uh, writing it and discover and writing down what you're actually going to be doing. So I think that it's important, again, it's important to work out the questions of who has more power and to discuss them, but it's also important to realize in partnerships that there's often power relations that relate to what's immediately going on in the partnership at that moment, and so it may not be so always so unequal, or it may be always unequal, but there may always be some people who unexpectedly have more immediate power in the partnership because of what they're doing. Third issue on uh, good partnerships is trust, and that's absolutely essential uh, that you've got to come, but again, it's like common aims. You don't always start by being in trust relations with the people you're partnering with. And again, obviously, if it, we're talking about women and girls transforming cities, you're not going to start some of these partnerships with feeling extremely trustworthy towards all the other or feeling. So the dilemma for me in the whole question of trust is that it takes time to build trust. And often time is one of the things that's really difficult to come across in the modern world. It's difficult for people individually to have time, but it's also difficult, um, for instance, to have ongoing partnerships that last a enough time to build trust. Because as we all know, often funding for projects lasts a year. Well, a year isn't long enough to build trust relations. And, and in some cases, the relationships that I, the best, sort of partnership relations I have in Ottawa have been built over 10, 15 years from a variety of circumstances. And 10 or 15 years later, you really are in a relationship. And I think trust gets built when you work with people and when each side of the people working together do more or less what they said they would. Nobody ever does exactly what they said they would do in a partnership, but more or less. And I think that over time, if you've worked with somebody and they've done more or less what they said they would, and you've done, and that's important too, you've done more or less what you said you would do, then that builds a trust relationship and that that trust relationship can build on and on. And I think, but again, I think the dilemma of trust is to have enough time to be able to build those trust relations because I don't think they build quickly. They never build quickly because you have to have worked together, as I say, and you have to have worked together on something. The, whatever you work together doesn't need to have been a great success, but it needs to have been something that was positive and that, as I said, you did most of what you said you would and the other person did most of what they said they would, and that builds trust. So, But I think there's a real dilemma in a lot of the kind of projects we get involved in because time is always very short and um, you get 
six months to do something, and that isn't. So I think there's a real dilemma between trust and time, and trust is absolutely essential. Next, uh, uh, next item, <coughs> excuse me, on good partnerships, is the question of membership structures and what I've called the management of ambiguity, because uh, membership structures in partners are often very interesting but moving. Somebody was in some position, and then they are not in that position, but they stay in the partnership because they like the partnership. Somebody uh, wasn't in the partnership, but then comes into a position that's on the partnership, so comes in. So there's often people who are in the partnership who are no longer in the position they were that made them part of the partnership, but they like the partnership and they are useful to the partnership, so they stay on. But it becomes unclear sort of what their official position is in the partnership. And so I think that that's an uh, ongoing necessary part of partnerships. I think it's good to have people involved who are who used to be in some position and who've moved on or who used not to be in some position but who've come into a position. But it does create sort of um, ambiguous relationships or ambiguous positions as to why people are doing what they're doing. And I think the management of ambiguity is something that is a necessary part of partnerships. And not everybody is as good at dealing with ambiguity. Or some people are better at dealing with ambiguity than are other people. And that's always an ongoing tension when you're working um, with institutions, with networks, with individuals. And good partnerships are always made up of people who are representing institutions, other people who are representing networks, other people who are representing, who are just there because they're, they're enjoying it and they're doing important things. And I think that it's one of the things of working through partnerships is this sort of managing ambiguity and making sure that you're conscious that some institutions, some people are just uh, less, less at ease with the idea of ambiguity, but it's something that needs to be worked through and can be very successful. The last one is leadership. And the important thing I wanted to say here, and I think this is a lovely example this morning, is partnerships need celebrations and they need fun. I, I'm big on fun. I think that it's that especially as you get older, you decide that you really only want to work with people who are fun. And, um, and that becomes a major criteria of deciding what one's going to get involved in in life. And, and the nice thing is there's lots of things that are fun. Otherwise, I might be more bored. But uh, so there's lots of things that are fun. But I think partnerships need to, and it comes back to a point that was made this morning about that often the celebratory, the things, the really wonderful things that women are doing to transform cities don't get celebrated, don't get mentioned, don't get honored, don't get uh, talked about. And I think that. Um, there's a lot of things that we should be celebrating, and that builds partnerships, and it's a, one of the qualities of leadership, I think, in partners, is being able to do that kind of celebratory, um, and celebratory of what we're doing, and celebratory given that women don't get as much space in mainstream media, we've got to be even sort of more celebratory and more fun. Then I'm going to give three examples um, and there's a lot of words on this, but I'm really just going to talk to it. And it's three examples of partnerships. And this is in no, absolutely no way sci scientific. They're all personal choices. They're all things that, groups that I know about. The first one is the City for All Women Initiative, which is a group in, uh, in Ottawa. And it's a, a group that brings together women from different communities, different organizations, and um, different universities who are working with municipal decision makers. And the project we've been working on with the City of Ottawa is an equity and inclusion lens, <coughs> which was, and I'll point to a picture which is more attractive, and I'll tell you about the equity and inclusion lens. This is just a group of people from Cowie, uh, City for All Women Initiative, Initiative in Ville for Toutes les Femmes. And it's a group, uh, we did, we'd done a gender, 
uh, equity lens. And the city of Ottawa kind of liked the gender, some of the uh, people working for the city liked the gender equity lens. And then they began to realize that there were going to be a lot of groups wanting a lens. And so they asked Cowie to develop a lens that would be gender and inclusion. And it covers 11 groups seen to be in danger of marginalization in the city of Ottawa. So it covers a lot of groups. And it, what it is is a small document for city, basically was done for city officials to be able to be more comfortable about dealing with an increasingly diverse population, more comfortable in giving better service, but also just more comfortable in knowing how to find resources about these groups. So what it includes is a basic little guide and then 11 snapshots of these uh, 11 groups in Ottawa, trying to point out uh, that the 11 are, if you want, all intersectional, i.e. that the profile on the Aboriginal population in Ottawa is there are Aboriginal women, there are lesbian Aboriginals, there are elderly Aboriginals, and so, and the same thing about the snapshot on people living in poverty makes the point that there are women living in pop pop poverty, there are Aboriginal women living in poverty. So it tries to make the point that we are talking about intersectionality, diversity, but also that there are resources that people can find on each of these issues. So that's um, the work that's being done, and it's very much linked to the city of uh, the city of Ottawa. And in fact, at the moment, uh, we're looking at the implementation. To what extent has the city implemented the equity and inclusion lens? Who's been trained to use it? Have they uh, learned what has been their experience in being trained? Are they actually using it? So trying to understand how, what's been the city's strategy in trying to implement it, and has the strategy succeeded in making the city officials, there's also a part that it's used in the community as well, but we're looking at the moment to see if the city's implementing it, and is it succeeding in making the city employees feel uh, better about understanding how they should be dealing with, or how they should be serving a more diverse population. The second example is a project called FAM North Net, which is a project of uh, CREA, the Canadian Research Institute on the Advancement of Women. And it's a project looking at the role of women in northern Canada. And lots of... Uh, Speak. But the important thing here is I'm um, actually working on a project in Thompson, Manitoba with one of the municipal councillors there, Charlene Lafreniere, who's chair of the Thompson Urban Aborigin Aboriginal Strategy and also a municipal councillor. Thompson is a city that's increasingly got a very large Aboriginal population, but a uh, Aboriginal population that does not feel comfortable in the city of, uh, of Thompson uh, for all the reasons that were so eloquently expressed this morning. And so what we're doing is we're doing a community history of Thompson, which is northern-centric, aboriginal-centric, women and family-centric. And as we speak, we've got students, as I speak, <laughs> they have got students in Thompson videoing interviews with uh, community people. And we're going to build a community history with the hope that then people will feel, particularly the Aboriginal population of Thompson and the Aboriginal women of Thompson, will feel more entitled to put pressure on the municipal government and to, to put pressure and to work with the municipal government in making Thompson a more friendly place and a more uh, inclusive place. And the last example is Women in Cities International, um, which I will flip to the pictures. This is a picture of a conference in Delhi, which was the third international conference on women's safety, which was a wonderful event, um, partly organized by Women in Cities, which is a very tiny little group in Montreal that works both in Canada and <coughs> internationally and does things uh, largely on creating safe and inclusive cities for the full diversity of women and girls. And this is a project 
This was, I think, in Regina. It was a Canadian project, again, with women in cities. And this was a, a, a circle uh, to begin the, the project in Regina, which was of uh, safety audits in the city of Regina, again, building a trying to build a partnership. And I was delighted this morning to see people from Williams Lake wh who were involved in a much earlier project in Women in Cities. And it's wonderful to connect back because that was also a wonderful project as Williams Lake was beginning to move in all kinds of interesting directions again in conversation. So thank you very much. Um, I will and this, and I was just saying, the part, the success of this conference is bringing together all the kinds of people who should be involved in women transforming cities. Thanks very much.